basically this kind of a snippet of the this basically the snippet of um, the various pieces of work that I have done. So here we have, like for instance, the the successful deployment of the application on Heroku, and then we have here on the right hand side uh, a snippet of the application itself. So let me um, jump right to the application. Uh, I will basically showcase the uh, the Vimeo. Uh, I recorded this uh, the working of the application on Vimeo. But uh, if, of course, we're going to have like, we're going to have like extra time, I, I, can, I can be able to run the application itself uh, on my machine, and then can be able to see um, how how you can be able to interact with the various features in the application. So uh, let me let me forward it. So here I'm loading the application. Uh, so I have run the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I'm loading the application. You can see here we have um, mm. uh, at the top here, at the top here we have the population who are affected by floods. And this is information Sorry. that is coming from. Uh, Sorry, Hassan. Uh, we cannot yes. see your your screen. Oh, sorry. So let me share again. Um, we we are still in the slide. In the presentation. Okay. Yeah. So I think I will have to reshare. Sorry. Um, no problem. Let me see. Okay. Let me stop sharing and maybe share again. Um, we need to share. Okay. Yeah. So um sorry for that. I hope you're able to see my screen now. Yes, for the perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so here um I'm loading the application. So I've started the application. I actually did the work on Google Colab. Um sorry, then, sorry, um, Hassan. Would will you mind uh like uh enlarging the, the video, please? So we can yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. Yeah, so I use uh, Jupyter Colab uh, for the for this work, and um, I used Heroc for the uh, hosting. But with the Heroc, of course, as just as I indicated earlier, there's some uh, the app is crashing, and uh, just raise a ticket to support to look at that. So, for instance, you can see at the top we have uh, um, I've done some exploratory analysis to basically look at the population who are affected by floods. Um, and then we're looking at uh, so there's the drop downs uh, which are offering the user the ability to interact with the with the data of interest that will have been collected. Uh, so um, so I can see here, and then we also have we are looking at the social uh, factors. Uh, we, we also have a section where I'm looking at the social factors that are driving the vulnerability of the population. For instance, the um, building resistance level, looking at like the material that uh, are used to make the floor for these uh, houses which the population is living in. I'm looking at uh, for also the material that is used uh, to construct the, you know, Basically, all the material used to construct the house. So basically, um, for instance, you can you can see in the application we have like most of the population are living in um, grass touched houses with mud floors, which basically gives an indication that this population already is at risk of uh, or at a high vulnerable level of being affected by flood. So I'm still working on uh, the EDA part, uh, getting to get a better understanding of like the factors that might be driving these uh, households to you know high or low vulnerability floods. And then once I have a clear picture of that, of course I'm going to go to the next step, which is building now a, a distribution model, which can be able to classify the households in terms of high vulnerability and low vulnerability. So this is just part of the work that I have done. Um, and of course, there are a couple of learnings here. I'm, 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 I'm also glad that in terms of like you know stitching the back end and the front end, um, putting in the CSS styling to just make the uh, application a bit um, good looking. Uh, and also in terms of the hosting itself, like I just mentioned earlier, I'm just getting these um, uh, errors when I'm deploying the application to to Heroku. So it's 
So I would say there's a lot of things that I've learned within the short span, short span uh, of participating in the in this program. And um, of course, it's been it's been really um, a very nice program in terms of like uh, building our capacity in um, uh, in building our data science capacity. Um, and um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to even work more with the ABW mentors uh, to help them uh, make this application um, more useful and uh, more robust in terms of. Uh, um, getting a clear understanding of like the factors that are driving uh, the vulnerability of households to a flood risk. So I think um, that's all I have at the moment. Um, I don't know if you have a few minutes for for questions, Claudia. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm I'm really happy, and I think I will be happy at the end of every of your every one of your projects because I've seen you since the beginning. So I really feel uh, I'm really really proud and uh, actually uh, technically I I find that it's much more informative to see uh, it to see it this way so you can already analyze for example as you mentioned the material it was also nice to see that you also made an analysis per age uh, for children and also I I saw that you also what was interesting as well to me um, was yeah so the source of livelihood, I find it really interesting because also the how it will affect them, uh, the floods, how it will affect them. It doesn't only, uh, yeah, you are looking beyond, right? So how it also the trade will be affected. So I, I find that really interesting. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, please, if anybody else has any questions also on the source of the data, also that's interesting to me. Uh, do you think you will keep collecting uh, data in other aspects? Has this give you insights uh, into other needs for data? Uh, yes, that's a very good question, actually. So what I did here is basically um, I used some secondary data from uh, some things that were conducted in the past uh, by different responders like Red Coast. And I also collected data from um, OCHA uh, website uh, on the, uh, this was basically I would, I would say um, geographical information uh, on the extent of um, the impact of flood in different parts of the country. For instance, the first three charts that you're seeing there, the graphs, uh, these um, maps, they are coming from OCHA and then the other data, the household data is coming from uh, secondary uh, data sources um, from responders like uh, Red Cross. Uh, and, um, Basically, those are my data, so I'm, I'm, I'm pulling them uh, using uh, Pandas APIs, uh, grabbing data from the, those uh, sources. So I'm looking at now in the future, in terms of um, making this application even more useful, I'm looking at creating an upload feature where uh, users or responders from the field can be able to upload data, and then we get near real-time information with the responders, um, like government entities, um, or um, I would say NGOs, um, governmental organizations, civil society can be able then to respond effectively to this population that are affected by flood. Because they can be able to see like the, the percentage of households that are affected by floods from you know that data that's coming in, uh, how, the percentage of this from under five and also elder population because I also have that data that's you know from the from the secondary sources, and then uh, you know the percentage of market that are affected the, the education facilities. And also, you know, looking at the, uh, you know, those factors can then, looking at those at various aspects can then help responders know uh, which household needs most of their help. And uh, from the government side, like which facilities that they need to plan for, you know, for construction and um, all that, yeah. So basically the major data sources, your uh, secondary data sources, as well as, uh, yeah, basically secondary data sources. Uh, web based, but I'm looking at um, you know having some APIs that can, or rather, people from the team who can be able to be pushing data using the data upload feature, and then we have that data analysis on real time. That's great. Thank you very much, Hassan. Uh, is there any other question? Uh, okay. Otherwise, we can uh, thank you very much, Hassan, and uh, we can now uh, start with uh, Ivan. All right, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Do you hear me well? Yes. 
So I see Igor here. Hi, Igor. Uh, Igor is Ivan's mentor. So thank you for joining us. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I am Ivan. I work for the, the Ocean Cleanup. Um, first, uh, I want to thank you, the mentors. Igor and Donato, thank you. And I want to thank you, the ABW and all the professors. And special thanks to Claudia, Parvati, and Margaret for making it happen. I'll be talking about numerical waves, uh, how we use numerical waves in the ocean cleanup, and how I plan to use a neural network to improve the accuracy of the model. Um, well, the Ocean Cleanup is a non-profit organization. Um, we are developing a floating system, which is now operating in the North Pacific Ocean. And the objective is to collect garbage uh, debris. And the main objective of the foundation is to read the ocean of plastic debris. Okay? And the efficiency of those uh, floating systems depend on knowing in advance where the concentration of plastic is higher. So if we can know in advance where are the main areas of plastic debris concentration, we are going to be more efficient. That's the idea. And, and how, how do you know? Well, we run numerical models in this institution. We run uh, wave models, ocean model, predicting ocean waves and ocean currents. And we run a, a model that can predict the transportation and accumulation of plastic. And so how do you know that um, this is going to help us? Because uh, if we can predict uh, the areas with high concentration of plastic, uh, we don't have to search for them. We are going to deliver the, the, the collecting systems right where the, the plastic is. And this is going to help us to save money. Well, one of the models that I use is a wave model. It's a numerical wave model that can predict uh, wave spectrum and wave height. If I know in advance the winds, I can use this model to predict the waves. And, and how do I know uh, how accurate the model is? Well, I compare the outputs of the model with observations. So I download those observations from NOAA. Uh, NOAA, NOAA is the American uh, agency. It's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And NOAA has many buoys in the, in the North Pacific Ocean collecting wave spectra, wave energy, wave uh, high. And then I compare the outputs of the model with the observations. And I, from the comparisons, I know that the model is doing good in some places and in others not doing so good. So the idea is to, uh, how, what can I do to improve the quality of the model? And I want to use a neural network. Okay. I want to use a neural network that can be trained on the existing numerical wave model to reproduce the wave spectra that is observed in some locations to a larger domain. And well, I, I started from a, an example. I, I got this code from a, an example that used the Gini climate data set recorded by the Max Planck Institute for bio, biogeochemistry. And this model delivers air temperature forecast, okay? And it, it uses TensorFlow, and the TensorFlow uh, function is used to do a time series forecasting. So the model is trained on the input data, which is a time series of air, te air temperature, to deliver forecast at the same location of the input data. And I have adapted the code to use another time series. I have a, a a uh, one year long time series observed in a, by a NOAA buoy. I have wave height and other variables observed in this location during one year with time interval of one hour. And I'm using this to train a network uh, to deliver forecast of wave height. So what, what you see here is the output of the, the, the neural network. What you see is the last 30, 72, 
hours of the, the, the time series, the, the last three days of the, the, the time series. And in green, you see the, the observations and the crosses are the, the forecasts. So it's a very simple model, which is delivering one hour forecast. That, that, that's it. And what are the expect chance? Well, um, for my work, uh, I expect to deliver more reliable forecast, more accurate forecast. For the ocean cleanup, we expect a, an economic impact. So if we know in advance where the plastic is, we are going to save money uh, navigating and deploying the systems. And for sustainable development goals, I, I expect to tackle goal 14, which is life below water. Uh, specifically, uh, I expect to tackle plastic pollution in the ocean. Uh, the key learnings that I have, uh, what I have learned from now, is that the outputs of the neural network, they strongly depend on the quality of the inputs. So if my time series has lots of missing events, if the observation error is high, if the observation interval is not uh, constant, so uh, in, in, in summary, if, if the time series as, that I use as input is not good, the outputs of the neural network uh, will not be false. So this is a, a, something that I have learned that I want to take in, to have in mind for the next step. And for the next step, well, uh, I have done a very simple case. Okay, Having as input one time series in one location, I was able to predict future, future values in, in the same location. Now, I want to, having time series in two different locations, predict the time series in a third location. And then for the future, I want, if I have the time series observed in many NOAA buoys, predict the time series in a grid, in covering an area which can be used by the numerical wave model that I, that I use for the, for the uh, wave forecast. And basically, this is it. Um, I have prepared a five-minute presentation, and if you have questions, then I'm open now for questions. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, yeah. Does uh, anybody uh, have a question for Ivan? Yeah, I, I have one actually. So uh, can maybe, can you mention a little bit, bit uh, more about the accuracy on which you can predict and now? Have you have you uh, measured uh, that? I don't have to show, but I can maybe if I go to my presentation. Do you see my presentation now? Yes. Uh, You see the time series here um, in red? Yes. Is the wave height in, in the NOAA buoy. And in blue is the output of the model. So you, you see that in some locations, uh, the wave height predicted by the model is very close to the observation. And in some days, it's not. Like in the middle of the time series and in the end, the, the, the model is, is predicting something that is higher than what is observed. That's what I mean by accuracy. The, the results of the model are not very accurate. And because the numerical model, it's not seeing the observed data. It is using a equation, a differential equation, which will compute the wave height and the wave spectrum from of the wind uh, direction and the, the, the wind velocity. Knowing the wind, the model will compute the wave height. And this is not seen in nature at all. I mean, it's not looking to the observed data. And that's, that's what I mean by being accurate. The model is not being accurate predicting the wave height. I'm not, I'm not sure if I was clear. If yeah, clear yeah, plan. yeah. You were clear on that, and I, but I'm wondering with what you are doing now. Uh, do you think? Uh, what do you? How do you? Have you had the chance to already see any uh, change in the accuracy of the prediction so far, or or not yet? 
Nokia. I, I, I did a very simple case, okay? I'm not, the, the numerical model is not participating in the equation yet. This is just a neural network which is predicting the waves based on the observations. Uh -huh. Yeah, clear. Yeah, anybody else that has a question for Ivan? Yeah. Or, yeah, okay. so, and, and, and finally, I think these predictions of the wave, right, is then used for, uh, let's say, the prediction of the plastic density. Yes, it's not exactly the wave height. It's something that we call Stokes drift. Stokes drift is uh, how the waves transport floating particles, okay? Mm. So, if we know Stokes drift from the wave model, and if we know the wind, and if we know the velocity of the water, the, the ocean currents, then we have a model that will transport the, the plastic debris, and this model will show us where the plastic is accumulating. Yeah, yeah. And show it in the future, because we have, we have forecast of the wind, forecast of the ocean current and forecast of the Stokes drift. So we can predict where the plastic will accumulate in, in the future. So when our people go to, to the ocean, deploy a new system, they have in advance the maps of concentration of plastic in the future. So this saves us a lot of money because we, we deliver the system where we want to- Very nice, with. very interesting. Yeah, yeah. this is very yeah, so, um um, this is very interesting for me because, you know, I'm also with the ocean cleanup. I'm uh, trying to optimize the steering of the boats. And uh, so this is input for me. Okay. <laughs> so are, you, yeah. are, you, are you working with Bruno St. Rose? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We work yeah. together. Yeah. Well, wow. very nice to know you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Dick is actually our uh, co-founder, co-director. So we are, uh, yeah. So you can of course keep in touch and, and then hopefully yeah, oh, you can yeah okay perfect yes. thank you very much yes. uh ivan very nice presentation and uh yeah uh let's uh, now we can move on to uh jazz uh yeah hi thank you so much uh, uh thank you claudia uh, and thank you everyone from uh, APW for being uh, uh, for giving uh, giving me the opportunity to be a part of this uh, cohort, and uh, especially to Claudia for for being my mentor and and guiding me through a lot of uh, uh, data analysis and uh, uh, visualization uh, troubles that I was facing because I'm not uh, a data scientist. I, I don't uh, work on data in my organization. I work on the strategy piece of it, how and why it should be used and how we can improve on uh, the kind of work that we're doing at the grassroots, how that can uh, benefit the communities that we work with. Uh, so let me start with uh, my presentation. Uh, can everyone uh, see my screen? No, I, I still see Ivan's, I think. Ivan, are you still sharing your screen? Yeah. All right, I'll try again. Yeah, no, thank you. Yes. Um, so as uh, I, uh, as Claudia mentioned, we are, uh, my organization, Protsahan, is working with uh, uh, children, especially uh, girls from uh, migrant communities who face uh, a lot of uh, abuse and uh, risk of uh, violence in their in their lives. So uh, we started off, uh, uh, I think just before uh, COVID, uh, we were working with about, uh, this is 2019, we were working with about 1200 girls a year. And uh, as soon as COVID hit, uh, our, our work on the grassroots, on the ground, increased so much that uh, we were working, we started working with so many more girls. Uh, due, at the peak of COVID, we were working with about uh, 
350,000 girls and their families. Uh, uh, and and at, at present, we're working with about 80,000, 81,000 girls every year. And in, uh, this number is excluding their family members. So each family has at least about five to six members apart from the girl. So you can multiply that number with uh, uh, that effect. And, and so that's the magnitude of, of uh, the, the grassroots intervention that we have. So uh, that uh, alone made us wonder uh, that how are we going to work, what we are doing, is it even having an impact on the lives of the people that we're working with? What is the kind of impact that, that, that's uh, happening? And what do we need to, what do we want to see uh, in, in their lives? Uh, one thing that was happening already at the grassroots, even with the small uh, number of girls that we were working with, uh, our, our grassroots social workers were very uh, deeply entrenched in the communities. They are all from within those communities, so it became very easy for them to speak to the people over there and get stories and get, uh, you know, uh, in time intimation that that one that some child is is facing a difficulty. So how can we help them? Uh, so that was a very rudimentary uh, way of collecting data. It was very uh, word of mouth and very verbose and very um, text centric, you know, text, a lot of text, a lot of stories from the ground. Uh, but that also helped us making sure in making sure that uh, what whatever we were doing at the ground actually had an impact in the girl's life. Uh, for example, if, uh, if, if uh, there was a issue of uh, no street lights in the community, that was causing uh, the girls and the women especially uh, to not venture out at night or be like they were they were forced to uh, come home early from their work they were not able to make uh, their their full daily wage uh, in many cases they would be denied that uh, wage for the day because they would leave early from their work uh, just to be get just to be able to get home before dark because they, there was no street light so when when uh, the girls from our community they they spoke about this they went out door to door and they checked uh, who was facing this kind of difficulty so we found out that there was more than 60% of the women in that community of about 200000 people uh, who were facing that difficulty every day so we uh, so those so the girls from our uh, centers they they banded together and they uh, went to see the, the municipal uh, authorities and they made that change happen because they actually went door to door to, to, to speak to the people on the ground. Another instance was uh, when uh, we realized that a, a lot of our girls, uh, uh, almost 89% of our girls were facing uh, uh, child marriage. Uh, they were being uh, forced into early marriage before the age of, uh, uh, at the age of uh, even 10 or 12. Uh, by their families because they were the families were not able to take care of the children uh, they didn't have the resources uh, and the only reason for them to to even think of marrying off their 10 year old daughter or 12 year old daughter was that uh, you know you, you're not our responsibility you're not going to be our responsibility anymore you get married and you'll be somebody else's responsibility so that we can free up our resources for for the boys especially uh, so the girls uh, uh, again uh, the, the oldest uh, 26 uh, uh, girls who were in the age group of uh, 15 to 18 at that point in time, they got together and they said, uh, okay, you know, this kind of a problem requires a very hands-on uh, solution uh, in the community where we can uh, talk directly to all the community members in a very, uh, in a way which is very entertaining and very uh, eye-catching to them. Uh, it, it holds their attention for a long period of time. And India being India, it's it's about uh, you know movies and and Bollywood and all of those uh, films and song and dance. So these girls actually made a one hour long uh, movie on child marriage. They uh, did a screening uh, on a large uh, screen in a theater for their entire community, where about uh, the three screenings were held of, in a theater of uh, with a capacity of fifteen hundred. Uh, so. The, the fathers of the girls came there and they saw their girls performing in that movie about child marriage and they uh, came forward to say that, you know, you know after seeing my daughter uh, form on screen, I, I want to promise here with, in front of everyone that I'm going to make sure she gets to study as much as she wants instead of marrying her before the age of a legal age of 18. So that's the kind of change that we were uh, looking at 
but in a very uh, one on one in a very uh, personalized manner so how do we bring that in in the lives of uh, more than 80000 girls that we are working with now earlier it was a small number 1000 1200 1500 but now we are working with more than 80000 girls and their families so that was the idea that was uh, the reason why we needed uh, uh, an application where um, all our grassroots uh, uh, team and the the wisdom that they have collected the the uh, kind of uh, uh, connection they have with the community how can we bring that to get more data uh, that would help us again predict and make sure that the children in the community do not have uh, the risk they can live their life with freedom and uh, with the safety of their own home and their school uh, how do we bring that in the lives of these uh, girls uh, who are who we are working with so um, uh, and in uh, in that process we also wanted to make sure that the community itself was the owner of that data they were themselves uh, coming forward to see that you know oh this is what the data says so okay uh this is what the problems are uh, facing our 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 girls are uh, the women in the community let's work on this together instead of um, us going and saying telling them okay you know what this is what your community needs this is what you should do no uh they say this is what we need help us get this you know uh enable us to get this done on our own so that becomes the cornerstone of uh, why uh there's a uh, there's also uh, that inbuilt uh, data democratization uh, built into the application that we're trying to uh, create here and uh, also uh, the fact that uh, it needs to be very easy to retrieve uh, and analyze the data because the grassroots people who are always on the ground they cannot spend too much time in in uh, analyzing a, a long form data and and uh, deriving some kind of insights from it it has to be readily available to them and it has to be very quick uh, for them uh, so uh, claudia help me out with uh, this uh, visualization piece a lot uh, just to show that uh, how child abuse uh, uh, for example uh, can uh, be uh, stemmed out by just making sure that the child is in school right uh at the age of 20 if she's in school and if she has a proper attendance over there and uh, the the school teachers are involved uh they have uh, they keep uh, uh, a track of the child's attendance they keep a track of uh, uh if something is bothering her if uh, they they keep talking to her they are they are completely they are properly trained in in handling child abuse cases or or child violence cases so that can help in a, in a big manner uh just the school attendance just connecting them with the school authorities uh, the public school system the government school system because the government already has everything in place we can't replace the government we just have to enable the the communities to be able to access that access to justice access to uh, the basic uh, uh, their, their rights and entitlements that they have uh, been provided by the by the constitution by the government so just this one little thing if we change in their lives that if we connect them to schools a lot of their uh, issues uh, child labor uh, their uh, abuse their their child marriage uh, that dips in a very uh, like a very strong manner um, if we uh, then uh, claudia was again very kindly uh, help me with this uh, uh, visualization to see how that uh, uh, how monthly income of family uh, can can you really correlate to the child marriage instances for example if if a family is coming from a rural space into an urban uh, system uh, urban uh, slum uh, a they are losing their their home their sense of belonging to something and they are coming into a place where they don't have anything at all so it becomes a very violent uh, kind of poverty for them where they don't have access to their to anything that they can call their own right so uh, in that case, in that scenario the the first uh, uh, victim is the girl child she gets married early she she is at high risk of abuse she is at high risk of uh, being thrown into uh, hazardous labor all of that happens for her and that 
is only because the family does not have enough resources to feed the feed all the children so if that happens the boys are given the priority not the girls so girls are instead uh, considered uh, the liability in that scenario um this is uh, something that we were able to uh, deduce with respect to what what's the uh, which states have the highest instances of for example child marriage here uh, if you see the blue line uh, in this graph at the top that's the instances of child marriage uh, in in the state of haryana which is the neighboring state of uh, the capital national capital delhi and it's uh, it's very high uh, it's one of those states where the the girls are not given their due spaces in the public uh, life um again uh, the the rights by uh, violation by age if you if we talk about uh, just uh, physical uh, harm and and uh, just just the uh, instances of uh, being at risk at high risk of of uh, uh, any kind of abuse that's uh, again in that same age group of uh, 10 to 19 is where it's the highest um from this program from this uh, uh, project we are looking to make sure that like i said that uh, we had a very small uh, set of people to work with in the beginning and now it has increased many fold so it it needs uh, that increase in in the uh, number of people we are working with it requires us to be prepared to bring the kind of uh, grassroots interventions and the course correction that is needed from time to time from our side to be there and be accurately available for the communities that we work with uh, it also is necessary for us to be able to go to the governments and speak to them about uh, what's happening on the ground um, and for example there was this uh, case where um, uh, the, the during covid uh, in the government schools uh, the government provides sanitary pads to all the girls uh, all the girls and uh, during covid it was discontinued so they had to go back to the uh, government authorities and say that oh you know what this is happening in in schools in delhi why did you do something and that's when they were able to do uh, uh, to to make that change if if just they can go to the government with data that you know we have this problem let's find a solution to it um again uh, it's it's uh, very simple but also it it it's required for us to be able to convey this to donors and maintain transparency with them that you know this is where the money that you have supported us with or resources that you have supported us with is is bringing a change on the ground for for the people that we work with um key learnings i'm i'm again uh, coming from the point that i'm not a uh, a coder any anymore in the last 20 years since i completed my engineering i haven't touched coding uh, but i am the guy who makes strategy with my team so uh, it came out that all of them at the grassroots level need uh, access to that data and which they can share with the community directly not just keep it with us but also to be able to show them you know uh, this is the scenario with with what's happening in your community let's do something to change that or you tell us what you need and we'll enable you to make that change in your uh, community uh and of course so there's a lot of uh, uh, i can show you one more thing uh yes yeah so this is the kind of this is the process that we used to uh, if you can see my screen with the uh, mind map here so this is what we have uh, utilized uh, used in order to come to the uh, conclusions of of uh, what we need in our uh data system so we have to answer these questions what are the um sdgs we are covering what are the uh publications that we have to refer to and how all that data uh, flow is going to map out is this is how uh, we came to that conclusion and uh, if somebody wants it i can absolutely happily share it with uh, you and uh, i think uh, that would that could probably give somebody else uh, a starting point for thinking how to go about the process like that uh, that's, that's great uh, yes thank you very much uh, 
as I told you before, I think this is a, to me, this is a really, all the projects that are interesting, but this is very, uh, very close to me. And so I will, uh, I, I really, please feel free. We can keep collaborating. Uh, it doesn't have to, to stop here. So you know how to get in touch uh, with me. So you are welcome to it. And yeah, this is really uh, the, the starting point, I think, for many more analysis uh, that we can uh, do with the data you have. Also, yeah. uh, from the inside and having seen the data, also, I um, have some uh, advice on maybe what uh, some, some changes that you could make also to make the data more uh, accessible and how to clean it uh, faster and easier so we can uh, yeah keep working on it. So if there is anybody who has a question for uh, Jazz and or otherwise uh, we move on because we are running a little bit late, uh, but this is <laughs> this is really interesting. So yeah, so thank you, Jazz. And now we go to uh, Saad. Thanks, uh, Claudia, I'll share my screen. Yes, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Saad. I uh, work for uh, Rutgers uh, Netherlands and uh, I'm going to present something uh, on uh, a dashboard that I try to develop on uh, Power BI. It's still in a very early stages where uh, I'm still learning by doing and doing a lot of experimentation as well, but I want to share how far I've got. Uh, to my project and also maybe can get some nice questions or recommendations uh, as well. Um, so Rutgers uh, is an organization, it's an NGO based in the Netherlands and we work on the sexual and reproductive health and rights of uh, young, young people uh, all over the world. Um, so when it comes to data science and analytics, we really do not have any in-house capacity or expertise on data science. Um, <clears throat> uh, we do have a research team as well. Uh, but when it comes to uh, very uh, advanced tools on data science, uh, they do not use that. And even if in our researches we do want to have expertise, expert data science or analytics, we always outsource uh, to uh, experts. Um, I work in the fundraising team at, at Rutgers Netherlands um, and in, in our fundraising department basically we keep a track record of our proposals that we submit to donors each year and we keep that track record in uh, Microsoft Excel. However, the data that we have in Microsoft Excel is sometimes a bit too scattered or it's, it's very difficult to basically analyze that how successful have we, we been in our fundraising efforts over the years and we cannot really use that data or have not used the data that we have in Excel for any future fundraising uh, resource mobilization strategies as well. Um, so that's why I, I, I became interested in, in exper experimenting that, okay, is there a way that we can use the data that we have uh, in a better way and integrate that into our future strategies uh, as well. I'll show you a screenshot of how we basically keep a record of our of our uh, proposals, for example. So this is like a very clean version of the data set that I was using. The original version, if I show you, was quite messy and scattered with a lot of rows and columns, which were not really uh, useful for me in my analysis. But yeah, this is like a screenshot of uh, how we keep. So we have uh, data sets for each year and description of what sort of a call we are uh, putting a proposal in, which country, who is, which is the lead organization, who is the donor status, is it approved or rejected, the total budget of the call uh, of the fund and what is the chunk of Rutgers and for which department are we fundraising for, whether it's a national program or a project or an international program or a project. Um, so keeping into in, in, in mind my expertise, which is none around data science in the past, and also uh, looking at what do we need uh, from this data set, I thought that business intelligence was a skill that I can start exploring and looking into. 
um, and Power BI is the tool that I used to create a dashboard, which basically gives nice visualizations and correlations on the data that we have around fundraising. I took the lessons that were provided by ABW on Power BI, and I also went through other resources online. Um, it took me a long time to clean the data set that I had to make it adaptable to the tool because, uh, yeah, like I said, that it was quite scattered, quite messy as well. And I had to again and again clean the data and experiment and do a lot of trial and error and experimentation uh, for Power BI to create a dashboard for me. Um, I would quickly share some basic charts and visuals that I, I sort of was able to develop, but there are a lot more other chart visuals that I did create. Uh, but it will take me a long time to share all of those but for example as you can see in number one this is like a like a basic pie chart in which gives an analysis of you know how what level of uh, funding did we get for international and what level of funding did we get for national so these charts are for the past four years at least starting from 2019. Uh, then um, like I said that we also keep a record of what was the chunk of the total uh, fund that we were uh, putting a proposal for and what was Rutgers share in that budget as well. So I created some bar charts around that. And then finally, I also created a bar chart around our success rate as well. Uh, it's not really success rate because it's not in percentages, but at least we get to know that, you know, how successful have we, we been in our fundraising and proposal writing as well. Um, I for for the future I, I need to get more analysis through Power BI in terms of what thematic thematic area have we been fo focusing on more in the past few years. If you saw in the data set that I show that I uh, showed you, uh, we do have a column which describes that what sort of a call are we pitching a proposal on. But it's a lot of qualitative data in that column, and I could not really use those words to give an analysis to me. So I want to really Quanti uh, make that column quantitative and see that how I can use that column to also show us that, okay, what has been the focus of Rutgers in the past few years in terms of the thematic area? Uh, and what donors did we submit the most proposals to? Like, is it like three or more proposals at least? And what has been our success as well? As well? I think that this can give us a nice analysis and insight into that. Are we too focused on a few donors and should we be more diversified in our donor? profiling as well. Also, what has been the average funding size of a pro proposal that we submitted or what was approved as well? It can be that we submitted a proposal uh, for which we did not have a very positive return on investment where we actually invested more time than actually the price that we got against that uh, funding as well. Also, I would like to have more further in-depth analysis on national versus international fundraising that we have done in the past as well because we do have separate data for national programs and international programs as well and i would to i would like to use this analysis for into our future fundraising strategies is that number one do we need to be less donor driven or more needs driven for example because i feel that Rutgers is an organization which is a bit too reactive to proposals and calls but there might be more value in other teams or areas or countries where we work in. Uh, and secondly, yeah, what should be the countries of priority for a future work? Because we do always keep a record of what countries have we submitted proposals for and have projects for, but there are some countries which we call donor darlings as well, but there are a lot of countries in which it might be more value to work in in the future as well. And we might need to see that, okay, maybe we need to look for those donors who have not worked in certain contexts and countries where they, we can add a lot of value as well. Also, should we explore other innovative, non-traditional avenues of fundraising because we work with a lot of big institutional donors specifically uh, on fundraising, but we need to see that, okay, are we too reliant on just institutional donors in the past and we need to diversify fundraising as well. And also what has been the trend of our fundraising, uh, what has been the donor behavior and profile that we have been uh, reaching out to in the past as well. And do we need to tweak or change our uh, fundraising trend in the future and make it more successful for the future, for example. Uh, key learnings and challenges was it has been a slow learning curve for me because, like I said, that I'm very new to data science and analytics. I, I, I do have some basic Excel skills in my job, but I've never 
had any experience with any any tool in the past also i work full time so you really need to take out time to do this aside from a job because it's not part of my nine to five job uh, secondly is that since there is no internal expertise around data science in rutgers so it becomes a challenge to um, team up with someone or ask for internal help from someone or advice or you know brainstorm with someone as well it, it, it does become a challenge when you do not have a uh, someone to think along with you, you know, in terms of what we can get out. Um, also, I feel that it took me a very long time to clean the data set that I had. And I think that it was a key learning curve for me on, okay, what sort of data sets are actually uh, useful for Power BI. Secondly is that how can I create vis visualizations for the qualitative data that I have in the data set, thematic areas, and how can I quantify those and show them uh, in, in, in the dashboard, that is something that I still need to learn and experiment on. I also felt that Power BI is a very, very powerful tool, especially in Excel, and I feel that the dashboards are very interactive. There are a lot of different visual, visualizations that uh, you can show in Power BI as well. And Power BI is very, um, I think, uh, hands-on in terms of also uh, cleaning your data sets as well as compared to Excel. It does a lot of things for you. Uh, in, in Power BI and it also handles very large data sets as well. Uh, and third, uh, last and but, but not the least is that how can I grow and sustain this skill and expertise given that there is no expertise internally in Rutgers, how can I share all of these insights uh, internally or is it something that I can start and you know take to the leadership and say that hey maybe we can be a more data driven organization maybe we can create a small team around uh, data science or data analytics that we can expand and scale in the future and integrate into internal change management processes or into our projects um, as well so yes that's it uh, thank you for your time and i'm happy to take any recommendations or questions as well thank you Saad. and I'm I'm happy to see that you are already thinking in the way of okay how can I visualize this and I think that is really key for you moving forward because you also if you can you can also have a say in there and into how the data is is uh, like the format of your data so that you don't have to spend so much time massaging it so that you can get the insights that you need from it. So I think that's one key learning that you got from here. And also all that you mentioned that you'd like to see like how many, how much of the uh, effort goes for uh, specific donors or specific uh, calls, let's say you all, now you are on your way to get those uh, with, with your, in your time now, uh, you are thinking already, oh, how can I visualize this? And I think what I'll be very interested in, in knowing is whether you can show these uh, outputs to people who make decisions with the data or to your team internally and see whether you can uh, yeah, convince them to record the data in a different way so that it's more uh, direct, uh, the change, uh, the like taking it and visualizing it, and also show them like the different uh, uh, visualization that you can get now and see if uh, like what comes uh, out of it. But I think you are already in, in your way. And I also like that you are thinking of taking the initiative within your team. And I think you are in a great position to do so. So also, yeah, if you need anything, uh, of course, uh, we are there. So let us know. And yeah, so really happy for you. And if anybody has a question for Saad, or yeah, or if you have, uh, please also, uh, you know how to get in touch uh, with each other as well. So we are uh, running really late, but I'm, I'm, yeah, it's really interesting. So we have about uh, six minutes for each presentation that is uh, following. And uh, does anybody mind if we skip the, the break uh, because we don't I think we don't have enough time anymore and I like to prioritize the presentation so yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry it's it's Claudia, okay. I, yeah. sorry I was just saying that I won't be able to stay for the rest of the presentations because I ah. have another meeting to run to but okay. uh, I'll I'll uh, watch look at the presentations later on of the ones that I missed as well yeah that's great okay. thank you Saad, for being thank here thank you so much bye guys yeah. bye Thanks. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so we continue with Sujan. 
hi colleagues good evening from ethiopia addis ababa i'd like to be uh, quick on this one um uh, uh, let me tell you a few things about my project actually i uh, thought i'd be able to do the image and really imagery analysis myself to identify the you know uh, the drought affected area uh, but that was not the case because of the workload i i couldn't do the same but um, as the project title goes uh, i have um, uh, made a model uh, to uh, identify the uh, locations for the durable solutions working group um, to to prioritize their interventions. So let me share my screen um, for, with you all presentation. Uh, can you see the presentation now? It's coming now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the title of my project was identifying suitable target area for durable solutions in the drought affected areas of Somali region. The business case being, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, business case being, you know, we have here in Ethiopia because of the drought and conflicts, uh, there are uh, more than 200, uh, sorry, 2000 displacement uh, sites. Um, and all those sites, uh, most of them uh, require a durable solution uh, interventions. Um, given the you know limited budget and the limited number of partners here, it is uh, difficult for us to prioritize the uh, you know the, the the intervention area basically. Uh, so uh, I thought you know this, uh, as a real case scenario, I'll work on this uh, project. I'll try to identify the uh, uh, the intervention areas for the durable solution uh, working group. Um, for the durable solutions interventions, the, the implementation costs are really high, uh, but the budget is really um, limited also. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we have to be able to maximize the number of people or sites come with the uh, available budget in, in the most optimal way. So keeping those things in mind, I uh, worked on, the, you know, trying to build the optimization uh, model, let's say, uh, but I have not been quite able to uh, come up with a model, but uh, I'm, I'm uh, sort of uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the right track, I should say. Um, the methods and tools used, uh, I basically uh, use the, uh, the data that have uh, been available to me uh, from the displacement tracking matrix that we have and the imagery analysis that was done by OCHA and the drought variety areas uh, and also the costs uh, incurred for all those durable solution interventions by the durable solution working group. So based on collecting all those information of the data that I have, um, I, I calculated the severity index um, based on three criteria: number of year IDPs uh, are living in the particular sites, a number of households per site, and the area of interventions uh, required or suggested by the IDPs. Um, I'll show you later the data set, uh, what, what sort of uh, fields we have and how I come up with the calculation. And also uh, the methodology used was identification of the cost component and sub components for each intervention, relocation or return or local integration and by also location, rural and urban. Um, identification of average cost per households by intervention area and location. Uh, and also assigning average cost to the number of households in the location to find out the total cost of intervention. The data source I used was displacement tracking matrix data uh, provided by Ethiopia. Um, and also cost provided by the Transition Recovery Unit and also the imagery analysis data provided by OCHA. My, the tools that I use uh, is uh, basically Microsoft Excel to compile all the data that I had to clean them, to process and analyze and to come up with the solution. Uh, here, the, um, this is the model that I use to score, uh, sorry, score the severity uh, uh, index or the priority index. Um, as I said, I had three criteria to score them. Uh, if the household is less than seven, they score what's eight for that particular location, so on. Uh, it goes up to uh, score five if 400 and uh, 
above households, then score would be five. And the time of displacement in the particular site, um, if, if it's less than year one, if it's more than four years and above, then, um, then it's five. Uh, the assumption here is the more the people are living in the uh, particular sites, the needs are high. That's why we prioritize the numbers of years being high and give them the highest score. And area of intervention required, you know, uh, in the data set that we have, people uh, or the uh, displaced community have um, indicated what are the interventions that uh, are required for them to go back uh, or return or to uh, relocate uh, to certain area uh, so that the durable uh, intervention uh, can be made. Um, so economic opportunities, so each is a big criteria for area starting Suhan, we can, is it only me or we cannot, uh, I cannot uh, hear you? We can't uh, hear you. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, we can. Hello. Hello. I can hear you guys too. Yeah, we hear you, but it's very, very uh, broken. So, we can't understand anymore. Okay, maybe we give uh, Sujan some time, but uh, we have to we can have to move on uh, to uh, because we are running late. So we let's uh, give some time to Sujan, and then we go to Undram. Hi, Undram. Undram. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. It's Undram from Mongolia. Let me share my screen. Can you share my? Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Good. So, uh, hello again. Uh, so, my project name is about like making the data processing and visualization within the graduation pilot program in Mongolia. I work for Red Cross Society in Mongolia. So, uh, the program currently implementing is also motivating me to do this small project. So, with the uh, <clears throat> Support from Asian Development Bank, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection in Mongolia. Um, we are implementing the graduation pilot program in Mongolia. This program will support 1,520 working age adults aged between um, 18 to 55 in poor households. Uh, These households actually also enrolling in the food uh, stamp program by government. And the, this program goal is to build on cash transfers to provide holistic support that leads to economic inclusion, diversified livelihoods and poverty reduction. So uh, this um, uh, a small, uh, this uh, like big program is uh, implementing in the three districts in Ulaanbaatar city and like targeting 1,520 households. And this will be implemented until uh, the end of next year. And uh, currently we have conducted the households verification survey um, to select the uh, households who met the criteria of this program. And actually this uh, household verification survey uh, like motivated me to this uh, to do this small project. So I have a data, but uh, we have like quite like lack of knowledge on cleaning and preparing, preparing the data for the analysis and also visualization the data and to understand the information and understand the data itself. And uh, this project goal was to uh, like focusing on to determine and apply methods that could further process drove the uh, data of this household verification survey of the discretion pilot program and performing the analysis and data visualization on the data. And uh, I have used these three uh, 
views. Actually, uh, before the pro uh, project uh, uh, started, we have collected the uh, all of the data from these more than uh, like 3,000 households using the COBA toolbox. And during this uh, the project, I have uh, Use it Excel for data quality check and data cleaning as well, and also use it the Power BI for data analysis and data visualization. And uh, this is the about like significant change which can be uh, like influenced and also like uh, I forecast in the future, like regarding my work. Uh, this can support us to understand the current context and current situation of the households and like basic of the program implementation. And also it can be influenced on the program direction and focus on uh, like based on the information we do have. And we can also uh, like select the uh, like program implementation and program activities based on the uh, like information we do have. And also it can be contributed to the establishment of the model program, which can be implemented in the future in, in different locations, because this uh, kind of graduation like um, approach is quite new model for us to implement. So uh, which will be expanded in the future. And regarding my organization, I had also like made contribution to strengthen human resource and capacity, like skills as me actually. And uh, regarding the sustainable development goals, it can be contributed to the like sustainable uh, development goal one, which is the no poverty because uh, uh, this uh, big program is also focusing on to reduce the like uh, poverty of the Mongolia. And key learnings. Uh, actually, I have learned a lot during these sessions we have in Wallodin and also shared like many, many experiences from the uh, like practitioners from the all over the world. And but during this project, I learned by doing actually. And I learned about data cleaning, how I effectively do it in the short period of time and also data analysis, which kind of data can be used for the visualization, which kind of data can be used for the like uh, program implementation, something like that. And also big part was the data visualization. And actually my major is statistician. So I'm like quite experienced in the like data processing part, but in the data visualization part, which was the like big uh, like learning and take, take away from uh, this project and this uh, learning journey actually. And uh, yeah, and they use it my uh, data. I have established it, this dashboard and my dashboard like includes four different information. First one is about like basic information of this uh, like graduation pilot program, like how many households we have uh, like in our, uh, we have and like location and like respondents gender and respondents like gen, uh, age and household members and it's also composition and respondent employed, uh, employment status. And from this second figure, we can also see, see the household livelihood, like it's their income, uh, like types of income and like financial decision. Uh, do they have any debt, loan, if they have like sources, purpose of the loan, like every size, average duration of the loan, something like that. We can see uh, from this figure. And from the third one, we also can see the living condition and attitude of the household. So what kind of like living accommodation they are living and they do have any like, uh, like protected uh, like drinking water or they have connected to the like central heating system, something like that. And also their uh, like, to, uh, like attitudes to improve their livelihood in the future, something like that. And uh, from the fourth one, we can also see the, their experiences, like previous experiences on 
their like household businesses, which kind of challenges face it, and also their future plan. Do they have any plan to get a job or do they have any plan to start a business, family business or something like that? So yeah, you seeing my data, I have created this dashboard and it was really interesting journey for me to learn about data visualization and something like that. And yeah, and uh, special thanks for uh, the ABV and project team and also my mentor for his like, uh, like great guidance. And thank you also for you, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Undram. Really interesting, and I really like uh, the how uh, nice your dashboard is looking already. Uh, we will also like uh, to, if you could share with us afterwards, uh, maybe in a blog post, uh, what you have done because it's already looking nice, and I know like, there is Thank a lot so more much. to improve. But please also, we will be asking you if you could maybe write it. It's also good for for ourselves to keep learning also to, to write about what we have done. Uh, so yeah, it's already looking uh, very nice. So yeah, so congratulations on that. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, because we are running late, we will have to move uh, yeah directly to Varun. So thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Hi, sorry, can you hear me now? Sorry, uh, I, I was in the middle, if I could just complete the Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, let's uh, have, maybe if we could finish each. Uh, yeah, sorry uh, for sure, that. I'll, I'll be, yeah. yeah, I'll try. Thank you. I'll try to be very quick. Okay, um, so can you see my screen now? Um, you should be able to see my screen. So I was saying that I was, um, I worked on the uh, model to uh, help the um, uh, durable solution working group to prioritize the location for the durable solution interventions. Um, so uh, the, I, I told you about the methodology. I'm not sure how much you are able to hear. Um, as these were the scoring criteria that you uh, are seeing in this screen, and for the severity scale, um, wherever the location scored five, uh, those locations were prioritized because of the um, extreme uh, need. Uh, and you can also see here the um, the method that I used to. Uh, uh, come up with a severity score. Uh, it's total number of scores uh, summed uh, divided by the number of uh, score criteria, which is three. Um, so the, the score came from one to, came in between one to five, and then the, the priority locations were identified. And um, these are the cost components that were uh, required for each of the area of interventions. Uh, here in the column, first column that you can see, um, the requirements were economic opportunity, safety, security, improved social cohesion, and corresponding to those uh, interventions, areas of interventions were shelter, conflict resolution, um, etc. If you see zero here, if economic opportunities are required, then uh, livelihood is prioritized, which is uh, provided one, and other were uh, regarded uh, as un uh, unnecessary uh, or not required. Uh, basically, these are the uh, Criteria as provided by the durable solutions working group. Um, from the uh, observations, uh, this is the result uh, that I've uh, come up with uh, based on the calculation that I made. Um, the, there are 11 locations for the priority of uh, severity index five, um, for which the total cost would be around 88 million for, uh, to, to intervene in the total number of 9,000 around households. Um, locations identification and sorting uh, again um, just to come up with the uh, uh, you know which which uh, locations to intervene based on the uh, uh, budget that we have uh, we have uh, here sorted at the locations based on the safety that they have um, um, the score and also the uh, total cost that will incur for the for that particular site. So assume let's have uh, let's assume uh, if the, uh, the the working group has a budget of thirty million, then they can come up to the locations from uh, the first one up until where their budget budget will exist for thirty million, uh, and then uh, yeah, in in this way they can uh, prioritize their uh, location of intervention. 
Um, most significant change that I, that I found from this project is um, being able to work on the multi-criteria decision making. I realized that when I took, took on the project, when I started working on this, um, there are multiple variables that will affect the uh, decision making or prioritization of this um, particular uh, practice. So different variables should be taken into account. Um, and use the model or methodology that have been created to identify the intervention area, at least only the uh, only the most uh, needy one, um, based on the prioritization. Uh, key learnings from this project for me is, um, you know, once you start working on the project, uh, there are many variables that affect the decision, and um, based on that, I had to limit the scope by making few assumptions uh, in the calculations. Uh, personally, the program has been very helpful in getting insights of what data analytics can do. With the project, I've been able to make, um, sorry, to take my knowledge further and implement in the real case. And the process was immensely helpful in enabling me to take on other projects. Uh, on the next steps, uh, I'd like to take the current model that I worked on and automate the process using Python and its libraries. And also, the model should be able to recommend the location based on the variable um, uh, and the and different constraints. Um, and I would also like to use the multi-criteria decision model to identify the location to optimally expand the budget and implement the intervention. Um, that being said, uh, how to reach maximum number of people with the minimum budget possible. Um, so that, uh, and also for this model, we have all the components required to create the models, variables, goals, and constraints. And I would also like to uh, invite the interested um, colleagues to work together to help me build and test the optimizing model and also the, as a last step generate the map with the locations uh, recommended um, as a visualization um, that is all uh, from my side i would like to thank my mentor uh, franz uh, for guiding me throughout this project and um, showing me what can be done uh, with the, with the help of the uh, you know, optimizing model. Uh, I have not been able to work on the uh, automation yet, but uh, that would be the next step. Uh, thank you all. And thank you, uh, ABW, for providing this platform and uh, giving this opportunity to, you know, explore the various ideas and the projects. Thank you so much. Thank Over you, to Sam. you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you, Sujan. Very nice uh, project. And I think. Uh, you took the very crucial first step of knowing what your data looks like. Uh, the first set of analysis to know what the second step can be. So I think you are in, a, in a, the right path. And also with the data sets that you mentioned that you have, you can also, I think it will be uh, possible to make also predictions because you say you have for uh, four years. Or, or how I don't know how much data do you have, but it would be nice to also do more beyond automation. Also, see if you can predict the areas where a draw uh, can happen, and also yeah, help in that way to monitor and to direct resources as well. So I think you are in the right path, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, looking forward to what's next and. Yeah, thank you. And now we are moving to Varun. Yeah. Uh, am I audible, Claudia? Yes, you are. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll quickly jump to the presentation. I'll share my screen now. Uh, please let me know if the screen is visible. Uh, Sujan, can you please uh, stop uh, sharing your screen? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, Varun, we see your screen. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my project is to uh, develop a monitoring system for uh, FLU, uh, which is agriculture, forestry, and other land use based landscape restoration. I work for Citrus Environmental Trust, whose core interest is environment conservation through uh, various uh, FLU based landscape restoration and water conservation. Uh, I was mentored by Parvati for my project. So uh, as we all know, there are some numbers about the number of trees that were there uh, on uh, in on the planet Earth before the industrial era. There were around 8 billion trees and 
uh, after the post industrial era we hear some numbers that now at present there are around 3 billion trees and there is still scope to plant one more billion trees so uh, and uh, on the other side uh, trees are considered to be one of the solution or uh, are classified as one of the solution for most of our uh, climate based uh, climate change based problems be it sequestration of carbon or uh, double, uh, enhancing the livelihoods of farmers or landscape restorations and various other factors can be added to it so around the globe there has been a talk about uh, tree plantation be it government or non government actors through various actions on ground afforestation reforestation and agroforestry uh, but at the same time uh, for organizations like us, there are two business cases developed through this. One is before planting the trees and one is after planting the trees. So first is uh, how to select the site which should be brought under, in, under the intervention. Uh, there will be, uh, as we all know, deforestation takes place every hour, every day we lose thousands of hectares through deforestation. These can be through human uh, forced efforts or uh, natural effort, natural induced deforestation as well. So how to select this site is the first thing that uh, we take a shape file and we try to analyze how uh, the geography has changed in the past decade or past few decades so that we can uh, focus on certain geographies which required immediate intervention to be put on or uh, how to prioritize which landmass require immediate intervention or which can which landmass required a delayed intervention. On the other side, once the trees are planted, we need to monitor, report, and verify the impact created by the intervention. Moving forward, uh, the methods and tool that I used is uh, satellite, Im uh, satellite imagery analysis. I am very new to data analysis. We used to collect satellite imagery, but only to see the first order impact, that is the visual impact uh, in the geography. Uh, to analyze the second order of impact, like land uses and land cover variation in above the ground parameters, including percentages in green cover, soil organic carbon, or land surface temperature are done uh, using this tool. So as you can see below, I have shared three pictures. This is one of the sites which is under our intervention. And you can see that there is increase in green, which is uh, showing that increase in green cover in the region. And then there is increase in blue, which, is, which says that how water conservation efforts are brought in uh, more retention capacity in the landscape. Moving forward, uh, uh, what change I forecast with this tool in place is first, I'll uh, in the scale in co uh, coming years, we'll be working on a larger scale. Even the government of India has put up a target to restore 5 million hectares of land outside forest. Uh, these are all our degraded lands, and we tend to focus on 40% of that location. So I'll be able to better uh, effectively deploy resources toward high impact intervention. My organization, on the other hand, will be able to showcase the out outcomes of its intervention, uh, whose core focus is restoring the degraded farmlands and to enhance the livelihoods of resource-poor farmers. Uh, this uh, in hand takes place with the landscape restoration project. Uh, coming to the SDG, uh, we cannot take uh, life on land in isolation because uh, with one SDG, we all know that all the SDGs are interlinked. So with life on land, uh, which can be better measured, verified, and documented, uh, the other factors like uh, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, uh, decent uh, decent work structures, all these can be measured with uh, with the indices in place. Uh, key learning, as I've already mentioned, I'm very new to data science and analysis. I learned how to use Git for uh, repository management. Then, uh, as I already mentioned, we were only using satellite imagery for first order analysis, that is visual changes increase in green uh, increase in trees or increase in green cover in the region now i am also using satellite imagery for analyzing second order impact which is uh, land temperature green cover change in green cover percentage and other such factors the way forward for my project is to work with a mentor and finalize the tool it is still in a very nascent stage where i was only able to understand impact on one of the site uh, but as i mentioned that we work on landscape registration i'll quickly show one of the site which is under Restoration. Uh, so uh, these all are uh, farmlands which are under the intervention, and the uh, the next step will be analyzing these farmlands and how the intervention on these farmlands has impacted the geography in and around. Uh, coming back to the presentation, and that's it. That's it from my end. Uh, I'll be working forward with uh, Pavati to finalize the tool, and then uh, uh, this tool is going to help showcase results. Uh, 
to the donor to the government non government actors and also uh, it will help in research to where to put our focus in restoration thank you thank you varun thank you very much uh, so yeah this is also very nice and uh, your topic is very uh, closely related uh, i'm working now with a uh, with some avocado farmers uh, in Mexico, and they are really interested in knowing whether there are, is deforestation related to the planting, the harvesting of avocado for yeah for the uh, consumption and selling because it's now a very popular uh, product, as you know. So it, this could also be very interesting. So maybe let's keep in touch. And also there is another um, colleague that we have that he has a lot of expertise also in the area. I know you already have Parvati, but if you like, uh, maybe with uh, through Parvati, we can get in touch with our other colleague. And uh, yeah, something uh, even better can come from uh, from your project. So really happy to see your progress. And thank you all very much for sharing your project today. Uh, we will uh, jump back to the main room because I think everybody, okay, I'll, I'll let uh, Parvati know, but I think, Everybody is done. So let's move on to close the, the ceremony and thank you very much. We hold it into our next year plans. Yeah, thank nice. you. Yeah, great. Yeah, so uh, let's um, keep in touch uh, with each other and also uh, 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 for the next cohort, uh, be uh, supportive uh, to for them, uh, so they can also uh, learn what you learned. Uh, and we we uh, continue to be this fantastic community. I think uh, everybody's back now. Uh, Claudia, I see you. <laughs> you yes. are also here again. Yeah. So um, maybe uh, we can close the session. Yeah, uh, Margaret, uh, thanks for yeah getting all the feedback. I was listening and I must say the same like Zidek, I'm also very emotional because this is much beyond what we expected uh, when we started this first cohort. And it's really amazing to see uh, all the progress you have made. And uh, I also would like to thank Margaret and Claudia a lot because this was a sprint for us as well. Uh, we are a small team managing so many uh, things. We had to make sure nothing fall through the cracks. So uh, yeah, Margaret and Claudia have been like super women in this endeavor together with me. Also, of course, all the mentors and the lecturers support have been amazing. But uh, I want to give a huge uh, thanks to Margaret and Claudia specifically uh, for this. Thanks. And Claudia, would you like to say a few words uh, to the fellows? Uh, because you, yeah, you were not able to speak in the beginning. Yeah, now if you can, that would be great. Yeah, so I like to thank you all and to tell you how uh, proud I am of all of you. And I thank you for uh, also for uh, your patience with us. Uh, we are learning as well, and you have been kind, uh, kind to us uh, throughout the whole process. Uh, so I thank you, thank you for your time and for making this really for making it through the whole thing. I, I really appreciate uh, the time you have taken and all the effort. And yeah, of course, uh, to to the team, thank you, Mahrit and Parvati, and everybody who has been there. So I'm looking forward to keeping in touch, and I know that uh, relationships have been created uh, with mentors, with uh, lecturers and with us, of course. So please uh, keep in touch and, and yeah, let's continue making this a, a success. Thanks, Claudia. Some next steps. Uh, so we are going to close the Slack channel with so many groups. Uh, I think we do not need uh, all these project groups and others, but we'll create a cohort one alumni uh, group in Slack where we'll invite not just the fellows, but the mentors and the lecturers. And uh, we keep on, keep on adding cohorts as uh, new uh, people join this uh, learning, let's say community. So I'll uh, send uh, an like a link for all of you to join and it is optional so please feel free to uh, ignore it if you do not want to be notified of uh, future things and if you do not want to stay updated that's 
perfectly fine. So it's optional. Uh, secondly, you will receive together with your certificate, which I uh, spoke before about, a handbook, which includes all the links and the slide decks and uh, recordings of all the sessions. Some of those we couldn't make publicly available, of course, because of some uh, agreements with companies uh, that provided the course, uh, but those will be shared only for you. And uh, yeah, you will get it, the right links in the handbook. And the handbook will also include all the details of all the mentors and others. So uh, yeah, you take it as some kind of follow up from this. Um, third, uh, for three of the fellows, we offer like pro bono support of 40 days uh, in the next year plus any of the fellows who would like to continue working on their project and implement it further and would like to collaborate with us uh, as an organization, please do reach out to us. We are always open for discussions and we'll take it forward uh, based on the level of discussions we have. And we are always open for collaborations, um, be it research or a project implementation. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from some of you. Um, fourth, uh, we are going to launch the next cohort, of course, next year. Uh, plus, uh, we'll have two new programs. One is for managers of non nonprofit, where we will not teach more about data science uh, hands-on, but more about project management, um, envisioning a data science project, how to design it, etc. One will be on uh, executive level training on digital transformation, how to set up a data science um, mindset within the organization uh, and how to help them in their transformational journey of a nonprofit. So we'll have three cohorts in total from next year. Uh, it, it will be renewed yearly. So if in your organization, if anybody is interested, please do share it um, in LinkedIn or others with the relevant people in your organization that will help uh, us reach uh, geographies and use cases where analytics can be used for a better world. And uh, yeah, we hope to uh, maximize the impact that we provide. Thanks a lot. Uh, I do not have any more to say and we'll reach out to all of you and let's stay connected. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Soon, hopefully. Bye. Bye. See you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.